Today on The Daily Dose, The Battle of Little Bighorn. Known by Plains Indians as the Battle of the Greasy Grass, the Battle of Little Bighorn was an armed engagement between combined forces of the Lakota, Northern Cheyenne, and Arapaho Indians against the 7th Cavalry Regiment of the United States Army. Part of the Great Sioux War of 1876, the battle took place along the Little Bighorn River within the Crow Indian Reservation of the Montana Territory. On June 26, the ensuing battle would prove to be an overwhelming victory for the Indians, as well as what would become known as Custer's Last Stand. Setting out on a spring campaign to engage the Indians anywhere they could be found, Colonel John Gibbon's six companies left Fort Ellis in western Montana Territory on March 30th, intending to patrol the Yellowstone River. Brigadier General George Crook's 10 companies moved north from Fort Fetterman in the Wyoming Territory on May 29th, marching toward the Powder River area, while Brigadier General Alfred Terry's 12 companies departed westward from Fort Abraham Lincoln in the Dakota Territory. Lieutenant Colonel George Custer's 12 companies and a Gatling gun detachment departed westward from Fort Abraham Lincoln on May 17th accompanied by Teamsters and Packers with 150 wagons and a large contingent of pack mules. At sunrise on June 25th, Custer's scouts reported a massive pony herd near the Little Bighorn River, along with signs of an Indian village, not wanting the Indians to flee before a fight. On the morning of June 26, Custer decided to attack without waiting for reinforcements. With an impending sense of doom, Custer's Crow Indian scout Half Yellowface prophetically warned Custer that you and I are going home today by a road we do not know. Expecting only around 800 belligerent warriors, Major Marcus Reno was first to attack the village until his line was overrun by upwards of 2,000 warriors led by Crazy Horse and Chief Gall. 29 troopers were killed during the retreat while another 15 men went missing. As for Custer's bad day, the precise details are largely conjectural, since none of the American combatants would survive. Later pieced together by Indian accounts, Custer's force of 210 men had been engaged by the Lakota in northern Cheyenne, about three and a half miles to the north of Reno's fallback position. After the battle was over, troops came to recover the bodies, discovering that the dead soldiers had been stripped of their clothing and ritually mutilated. The dead were hastily buried where they fell, while Custer's body was discovered with two gunshot wounds, one to his left chest and the other to his left temple. Some Lakota oral histories assert that Custer committed suicide to avoid capture and subsequent torture, though this is usually discounted by historians since the wounds were inconsistent with his known right-handedness. And there you have it, the Battle of Little Bighorn, Today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, the D-Day invasion at Normandy. Codenamed Operation Overlord, but often referred to as D-Day, the June 6, 1944 invasion of five Normandy beachheads would prove to be the largest seaborne invasion in the history of human warfare. Confident that an Allied invasion attempt of Nazi-occupied Europe would come somewhere in the western seafronts facing Great Britain, from 1942 to 1944, Hitler built a coastal defense and fortification system known as the Atlantic Wall, which spanned 1,600 miles of coastline from Belgium to the northern border of Spain. In the months leading up to the invasion, the Allies conducted a substantial military deception plan known as Operation Bodyguard, designed to mislead the Germans as to the date and location of the main Allied landings. While the original D-Day invasion was set for June the 5th, bad weather forced General Dwight D. Eisenhower to delay the operation by 24 hours, which nearly triggered a further delay of two weeks since the invasion planners had strict requirements that coincided with the phase of the moon and subsequent high tides associated with a full moon. Conditions that aligned on only two days per month, the amphibious landings were preceded by extensive aerial and naval bombardment, followed by the landing of 24,000 airborne troops shortly after midnight on June 6. 
Allied infantry and armored divisions began landing on the coast of France at 6.30 that same morning, spanning a 50-mile swatch of Normandy beachheads known as Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno, and Sword. The men landed under heavy fire from Nazi gun emplacements overlooking the beachheads, which were strewn with landmines and metal tripods to further slow the Allied troop advances. Comprised of eight Allied navies, the invasion fleet was made up of 6,939 vessels, including 1,213 warships, 4,126 landing craft, 736 ancillary craft, and 864 merchant vessels. Around 156,000 Allied soldiers and paratroopers landed at Normandy on June the 6th, while a total of one and a half million troops would flood into Europe via the Normandy beachheads by the end of the week. 10,500 Allied troops would be killed, wounded, missing, or made prisoner of war on that first invasion day, while the Germans would suffer a nearly equal number of losses. And there you have it, Operation Overlord, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, the codebreakers of World War II. Born in London in 1912, Brilliant mathematician Alan Turing studied at both Cambridge and Princeton before joining the British government Code and Cipher School at Bletchley Park in Buckinghamshire, where top secret work was carried out to decipher the military codes used by the Axis nations. The main focus of Turing's work at Bletchley was to crack the Enigma code, a type of enciphering machine used by the German armed forces to send secure messages between troop field commands as well as naval vessels at sea. Although Polish mathematicians had worked out how to read Enigma messages and had shared their knowledge with the British before the Nazis rolled into Poland, the Germans increased security measures at the outbreak of war by changing their cipher system daily. This made the task of breaking the code exponentially more difficult. Along with fellow codebreaker Gordon Welchman, Turing played a key role in breaking the Nazis' code by developing a machine called the bomb, which significantly reduced the work of breaking the ever-changing German code. Turing then went on to decipher the more complex Enigma code used by the German Navy, whose U-boats were inflicting heavy losses on Allied shipping. German naval Enigma messages were able to be read from 1941 onwards because of Turing's work, prompting Supreme Allied Commander Dwight D. Eisenhower to comment after the war that breaking the Enigma Code was a decisive part of the Allies' victory over the Germans. Before the war, Turing invented a hypothetical computing device that became known as the Universal Turing Machine, and after the war's conclusion, he continued to build on his earlier work, eventually publishing a design for what he called an automatic computing engine a clear forerunner to the modern computer of today. In 1952, Turing was arrested for homosexuality and found guilty of gross indecency. The conviction was overturned when he agreed to undergo chemical castration. In 1954, he was found dead from cyanide poisoning, which was later ruled a suicide. And there you have it, the codebreakers of World War II, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, VE Day. Following six years of bloody warfare, the Allies' punishing air and ground offensive at long last broke the back of the Nazi war machine. Heavy air attacks gained superiority over the German Luftwaffe, while repeated attacks on German oil refineries stopped the Nazis' mechanized ground advances in all fronts of the war in Europe. In March and April of 1945, Germany was in endgame as the Soviets closed in on the German capital of Berlin. On April 30th, Hitler and some of his top aides committed suicide, all but cementing the final collapse of the once dominant Nazi regime. On May the 8th, after the Allies accepted Germany's unconditional surrender of its armed forces, Allied nations erupted in mass celebration as the war in Europe came to a close. More than a million people celebrated on city streets throughout Great Britain, 
while crowds amassed in London's Trafalgar Square and up the mall to Buckingham Palace, where King George VI and Queen Elizabeth joined Prime Minister Winston Churchill on a palace balcony, whipping the crowds into a triumphant high note. The future Queen Elizabeth II and her sister Princess Margaret were allowed to wander incognito among the amassing crowds, taking in the frenzy of celebration like average women on the street. Coinciding with Harry Truman's 61st birthday, the sitting American president dedicated the victory to the memory of his predecessor, Franklin D. Roosevelt, who had died less than a month earlier from a catastrophic cerebral hemorrhage. As American cities erupted in celebration, by the end of the day, Truman confessed that the victory made it his most memorable birthday to date. In France, after years of Nazi occupation, the liberated French took to the streets in orderly jubilation, fully aware that better days were finally here to stay. While most celebrants felt the elation of victory in Europe, both Churchill and Truman tempered their citizens with the weighing truth that war against Japan had not yet been won. In his radio address on VE Day, Churchill told the British people that we may allow ourselves a brief period of rejoicing, but Japan remains unsubdued. In America, Truman's May 8th birthday broadcast said that the fall of the Nazis was a victory only halfway won. And there you have it, VE Day, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, the U-2 spy plane incident, May 1st, 1960. At 6.20 in the morning, Sunday, May 1st, 1960, Francis Gary Powers taxied onto the runway at Peshawar Air Base in Pakistan. Engineered to fly at 70,000 feet with a range of 7,000 miles, Powers flew his U-2 spy plane into Soviet airspace for his 28th mission. Flying in radio silence, Powers was scheduled to pass over the Hindu Kush range of the Himalayas into the southern USSR passing over a 2,900-mile swatch of Soviet territory, a tense nine-hour flight into enemy terrain. Over Sverdlovsk, he felt a violent shudder of his aircraft just as he lost control as the plane leaned into a spin, parachuted into Soviet territory, where he was swiftly made a prisoner of war. Initially, U.S. authorities acknowledged the incident as a loss of a civilian weather research aircraft operated by NASA but were forced to admit the mission's true purpose when a few days later the Soviet government produced the captured pilot and parts of the U-2 plane, including photographs of Soviet military bases taken during the mission. Powers was convicted of espionage and sentenced to three years of imprisonment plus seven years of hard labor, but was released two years later on February 10, 1962 during a prisoner exchange for Soviet officer Rudolf Abel. Abel had been arrested by the FBI in 1957 on charges of conspiracy in the United States. The incident occurred during the presidency of Dwight D. Eisenhower and the premiership of Nikita Khrushchev, around two weeks before the scheduled opening of an East-West summit in Paris. It caused great embarrassment to the United States and prompted a marked deterioration in the relations with the Soviet Union, already strained by the early days of the Cold War. As a result of the spy plane incident and the attempted cover-up by the American government, the four-power Paris summit was not completed. At the beginning of the talks on May 16th, there was still hope that the two sides could come together even after the events that had taken place on May 1st, but Eisenhower refused to acknowledge or apologize for the incident, and Khrushchev left the summit one day after it began. And there you have it, the U-2 spy plane incident explained on The Daily Dose. Get your nerd on with The Daily Dose and learn something new every day. Subscribe to The Daily Dose on YouTube or sign up for emails at dailydosenow.com. Today on The Daily Dose, the sinking of the Lusitania. Launched in 1906 by the Cunard Line, the nearly 800-foot-long ocean liner was comprised of nine passenger decks housing a maximum 2,198 passengers, along with 850 crew members. It would be the first ship of the Cunard Line's four-funneled grand trio of ships, which would soon include the RMS Mauritania and the RMS Aquitania. 
On May 7, 1915, amidst some of the worst early combat of World War I, the RMS Lusitania was sunk by a German U-boat as it made its way from Liverpool to New York City. Of the 2,000 men, women, and children aboard, 1,200 would perish after the torpedo found its mark. Arguably one of the most luxurious vessels in the age of ocean liners, the Lusitania sank in less than 18 minutes after the German torpedo struck its hull. The vessel went down in 300 feet of water, 11 miles off the southern coast of Ireland. Backlash following the sinking turned public opinion in many countries against the Huns, contributing greatly to the United States' entry into the war. Argument over whether the ship was a legitimate military target raged back and forth for many years during and after the war, as both sides made misleading claims about the ship's purpose and intent. For their part, the Germans justified categorizing the Lusitania as a naval vessel, since at the time of her sinking, the ship was carrying over 4 million rounds of small arms ammunition, nearly 5,000 shrapnel shell casings, and 3,240 brass percussion fuses. The Germans further argued that the Lusitania, like many British merchant ships, routinely violated the internationally recognized cruiser rules, which forbade attacks on civilian ocean liners and non-military merchant ships. In 1982, the British indeed admitted that munitions were on board the ship, although no active weapons were aboard. As for the Germans' decision to take the lives of 1,200 innocent victims, it remains a glaring stain to their reputation as a humane and ethical nation, only to be dwarfed by the inhumanity of the Holocaust committed by the Germans in World War II. And there you have it, the sinking of the Lusitania, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, Kamikaze Attacks of World War II. On June 20th, 1944, after losing over 400 carrier-based fighters during the two-day battle of the Philippine Sea, not to mention losing its geographic defense line between Japan's oil fields in Southeast Asia and the Japanese Empire, Captain Motohara Akumura proposed kamikaze suicide tactics to his superior officers. Known as body attacks or taiatari in Japanese, kamikaze planes were modified fighters loaded with high explosives intended to maximize damage on enemy naval vessels, with a particular emphasis on sinking allied aircraft carriers. While the Japanese war machine suffered from diminished industrial capacity as well as inferior fighter planes compared to the American-built Grumman F6F Hellcat and the Foyt F4U Corsair, Japan's Samurai Bushido code of death before defeat made kamikaze attacks a favored go-to tactic in the months leading up to Japan's surrender. Meaning divine win or spirit win, Japan's kamikaze program accelerated after the October 25th sinking of the American aircraft carrier St. Lou, quickly expanding to over 2,000 flying bombs by the end of the year. An Allied naval defensive tactic known as Big Blue Blanket was quickly ushered into place, which established Allied air supremacy well away from the main carrier task force. Utilizing a line of picket destroyers and destroyer escorts sailing at least 50 miles out from the main carrier force, the Allies were able to provide early radar interception of inbound kamikaze fighters, which allowed for improved coordination between fighter direction officers on board Allied aircraft carriers. Despite these defensive measures, however, Hail Mary, before Japan's eventual surrender after the Allies dropped nuclear bombs on Hiroshima, and Nagasaki. And there you have it, kamikaze attacks of World War II, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, Bay of Pigs Invasion. Covertly funded by the CIA, the three-day Bay of Pigs invasion would prove to be a disaster for the Kennedy administration, going down as one of the most glaring failures in CIA history. In 1952, American ally General Fulgencio Batista led a coup against Cuban President Carlos Prio, forcing Prio to flee the island nation into exile in nearby Miami. 
The overthrow inspired Fidel Castro to form the 26 July movement, which would escalate into the Cuban Revolution of December 1958. Once in power, Castro nationalized all American business interests on the island, including banks, oil refineries, as well as sugar and coffee plantations, before severing previously close relations with the United States. In its place, Castro embraced relations with America's Cold War rival, the Soviet Union. In response, U.S. President Dwight D. Eisenhower allocated $13.1 million to the CIA in March 1960 for direct use against the Castro regime. The money helped to form a Cuban exile paramilitary group called Brigade 2506, an armed wing of the Democratic Revolutionary Front whose sole objective was the overthrow of Castro's increasingly communistic-backed regime. Aided by the CIA and strategic U.S. military personnel, the counter-revolutionary unit of 1,400 Cuban paramilitaries was trained in Guatemala. On April 17, 1961, the newly minted President John F. Kennedy allowed the invasion attempt to go forward. However, he stripped the mission of direct support of U.S. air and naval assets, which almost certainly doomed the invasion attempt to failure. Two days earlier, eight CIA-supplied B-26 bombers had attacked Cuban airfields, allowing the invasion force to land uncontested on a beach in Playa Garon in the Bay of Pigs, where it was soon overwhelmed by local Cuban militias. Within three days, the invaders had been defeated and thrown into Cuban prisons. The three-day Bay of Pigs invasion would prove to be a disaster for the Kennedy administration going down as one of the most glaring failures in CIA history. On September 12, 1962, many historians believe that Kennedy's Let's Go to the Moon speech was a belated attempt to deflect attention from his mistakes during the Bay of Pigs invasion, while his inept understanding about the geopolitical importance of Cuba would go on to spawn the Cuban Missile Crisis of October 1962 when the Soviet Union installed nuclear missile batteries on Cuba aimed directly at the United States, a mere 90 miles away. And there you have it, the Bay of Pigs invasion, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, the fall of Saigon. On Tuesday, April 29, 1975, the usually crowded streets of Saigon were empty except for military personnel and ambulances. The attack by North Vietnamese forces at Tan Sanat Airport the day before has left the city in a 24-hour lockdown. With communist forces pressing in on downtown Saigon, the order to evacuate American nationals and South Vietnamese sympathizers was given. The original plan was to bus the evacuees to Tan Sanat Airport until it too came under fire by the communist building offensive. Journalists filming the air attacks witnessed a North Vietnamese helicopter go down by the presidential palace. At least 10 people died in the crash. American Ambassador Graham Martin took personal control of the situation. Amidst tremendous confusion and a total breakdown in military protocol, a steady procession of helicopters began landing within the relative safety of the walled American embassy compound. Frightened civilians were airlifted to the American aircraft carriers Hancock and Midway, waiting some 40 miles offshore, ferried by a dedicated task force of some 80 American helicopters. Many of the surviving evacuees recalled that the most unnerving part was waiting for a ride to safety, all the while hearing artillery fire in the near distance, which only amplified their fears that the airlift would suddenly come to an end should the communist overtake the city. Besides the 80 American helicopters shuttling people to safety, South Vietnamese helicopter pilots flew their families to safety aboard the carriers as well. But lacking the space on the flight decks to stow their aircraft, the pilots were forced to ditch in the ocean or have their ships pushed into the sea. In all, approximately 7,000 people, most of them Vietnamese, were airlifted to safety during the 12-hour operation known as Frequent Wind, 
Desperate Vietnamese who failed to make the cut stayed at the embassy gates well into the night, desperately appealing for a Hail Mary last-minute evacuation. But for them, there was to be no mercy from the impending communist takeover. As the last of the Marines took to the rooftop of the embassy in hopes of their own Hail Mary evacuation, North Vietnamese tanks and troop carriers rolled into the city. The last of the Marines were finally airlifted from the rooftop, just as the communists stormed the compound gate. And there you have it, the fall of Saigon, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, the Cuban Missile Crisis and the Cold War. In 1959, Fidel Castro seized control of the island nation of Cuba, a mere 90 miles from the American mainland. Shortly after the coup, Castro declared Cuba a communist nation and began forging a tight relationship with the Soviet Union. Concerned about the proliferation of communism, in April of 1961, the U.S.-backed Bay of Pigs invasion proved to be an enormous disaster further straining Cold War tensions between the Soviet Union and the United States. In response, in 1962, the Cubans and Soviets began secretly building nuclear missile sites on Cuba, which would offer the Soviet Union an unprecedented first-strike capability against the Americans. On October 15th, U.S. intelligence personnel discovered the existence of Russian nukes on Cuba prompting President John F. Kennedy to mandate a naval blockade against any Soviet ship approaching the island nation. On October 22nd, Kennedy announced the threat to the nation, causing widespread panic across North America. After the Soviets refused to acknowledge the existence of any missiles on Cuba, the United States began to initiate the early stages of an invasion plan. On October 25th, the Soviets challenged the blockade for the first time eventually turning away from Cuba in the face of superior U.S. naval strength and determination. On that same day, Adlai Stevenson, the U.S. ambassador to the United Nation, confronted the Soviets in the U.N. General Assembly, revealing U-2 spy plane photographs which forced the Soviets to admit that the missile bases existed. The crisis finally ended on October 28, when JFK and Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev reached a secret agreement which called for the removal of Soviet missiles on Cuba in exchange for the removal of U.S. missiles in Turkey, which posed an equal geographic threat to Russia and her Eastern Bloc satellites. To this day, the Cuban Missile Crisis is regarded as the closest the United States has ever come to nuclear war, as well as a defining moment in the Cold War's ongoing threat of mutually assured destruction. And there you have it. The Cuban Missile Crisis and the Cold War, today on The Daily Dose. If you like learning something new every day, subscribe to The Daily Dose on YouTube or sign up for emails at dailydosenow.com. Today on The Daily Dose, Hitler's Olympic Games. For two weeks in August 1936, athletes descended upon Berlin for the 11th Olympic Games. Visitors and athletes alike were warmly welcomed, but behind the pomp and pageantry were ominous signs of a Nazi regime gone bad. The swastika was openly displayed on banners around town and at the Olympic Stadium, while the German sense of Aryan supremacy was a hard thing to conceal. After the aggressions displayed by the Germans during World War I, Hitler and his propaganda machine used the Olympics as a way to present a kinder, gentler image to a largely skeptical world. Off the field, the truth about what the Nazis were up to was hard for foreigners to miss. By 1936, Jews and other minorities had been openly stripped of their civil rights and even their citizenship, while Jewish-owned businesses were forced to display the Star of David on their storefronts. History would later reveal that the Nazis had already opened their first concentration camp by the time the games began. Prior to the start of the games, debate raged in the U.S. and other participating countries about whether to attend at all. But in the end, 49 nations, including the United States, came to Germany to compete. And at the opening ceremonies, Visiting athletes and spectators alike witnessed Aryan athletes following the footstep of ancient Greeks. 
bringing fire from Mount Olympus in the first ever Olympic torch relay. Popular history remembers Jesse Owens' four gold medals, an Olympic first for any athlete, no doubt causing great embarrassment to the Germans' belief in their Aryan supremacy. The Games also stood as a major corruption to the ideals sacred to the Olympic Games, creating an illusion of a peaceful and tolerant nation that was the farthest thing from the truth. Three years later, Nazi stormtroopers would blitzkrieg into Poland, setting off six years of war that would cost the lives of 60 million people. And there you have it, Hitler's Olympic Games, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, Hitler wants a wall. As early as December 1941, Nazi leader Adolf Hitler ordered that plans be drawn up for the construction of an Atlantic Wall, which would ultimately set off a monumental effort to create defensive fortifications along the entirety of the west coast of Europe. Work began in the spring of 1942 and by April of the following year, almost a quarter million conscripted French laborers were at work building massive coastal fortifications, batteries, mortars and defensive masonry walls capable of stopping or at least slowing a mechanized invasion from the sea. From the tip of Norway to the Spanish border, every beach along nearly 2,000 miles of coastline was to be made impassable. Naval guns were housed in what the Nazis believed to be indestructible bunkers, while behind the Atlantic Wall, tracks were laid for railway guns capable of hurling shells as far away as England. In the fall of 1943, Hitler became even more convinced that an Allied invasion along the Atlantic coast of Europe would soon become an inevitable reality. Known as the Desert Fox, Hitler ordered Rommel to undertake an inspection of the Atlantic Wall defenses and to prepare for what Hitler believed would be a decisive engagement between Allied and German forces. Believing also that the invasion would be launched across the Straits of Dover, against the Pas de Calais region, Hitler ordered this sector to be given priority over other sectors of the Atlantic Wall construction project. But by mid-1944, while fortifications in and around the Pas de Calais region were deemed completed, other sectors were far from ready for an impending Allied invasion, particularly in and around Normandy, France. As a result of this defensive frailty, on June the 6th, 1944, the Allied invasion of Normandy took place at five beachheads known as Omaha, Juno, Utah, Gold, and Sword. Supported by 6,939 naval warships and landing craft, around 156,000 Allied soldiers and paratroopers landed on D-Day, while a total of a million and a half Allied troops would flood into Europe via the Normandy beachheads by the end of the week. 10,500 Allied troops would be killed, wounded, missing, or made prisoner of war by the end of the first day, while the Germans would suffer a nearly equal number of casualties. Ten months later, Allied troops would storm the Nazi capital of Berlin, ending six years of bloodshed that cost the lives of 75 million people. And there you have it, Hitler wants a wall, today on The Daily Dose. Today in the Daily Dose, the liberation of Paris. Upon word of the approach of General George Patton's Third Army towards the outskirts of Paris, the French forces of the interior, part of the French resistance, staged an uprising against the German garrison occupying the city. Seven weeks after Operation Overlord and the D-Day invasion of Normandy, on the night of August 24, 1944, Elements of General Philippe Leclerc's 2nd French Armored Division made their way into Paris shortly before midnight. The next morning, they would be joined by the bulk of the U.S. 4th Infantry Division, whereupon Wehrmacht Commander Dietrich von Cholzitz surrendered to the French at the Hotel Maurice, the newly established headquarters of General Charles de Gaulle of the victorious French Army. Despite scattered attempts at scorched earth and sabotage by the retreating Wehrmacht forces, when elements of the French, British, and American armies poured into the city, Parisians responded with cheers, wine, and kisses. Allied airmen flying low over the city saw little material damage, 
But after four years of German uniforms, jackboots, swastikas, and Nazi salutes, Parisians were swept away by a tidal wave of jubilation and relief. Approaching Notre Dame Cathedral by way of the Hotel de Ville, snipers opened fire at General de Gaulle's motorcade. People in the crowds crouched down or ran for cover, while de Gaulle himself largely ignored the threat. When the snipers were put out of action, the city would see four straight days of celebration and parades. Vive Paris, vive de Gaulle, vive la France. And there you have it, the liberation of Paris, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, the Rough Riders of the Spanish-American War. After the Spanish sunk the USS Maine during the Cuban War of Independence and conjointly the Spanish-American War of 1898, President William McKinley put out an urgent call for an elite force of volunteers to chase the Spanish out of the Caribbean. Because of the hot and humid conditions native to Cuba, an odd assortment of patriotic volunteers was selected from the hot climate states of Arizona, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Texas, consisting of cowboys, gold prospectors, hunters, gamblers, Native Americans, and Ivy Leaguers from the East Coast. Army doctor Leonard Wood led what would become known as the Rough Riders, while Assistant Secretary of the Navy Theodore Roosevelt served as second in command. After forming up at the now famous Menger Hotel Bar in San Antonio, Texas, on May 29, 1898, 1,060 Rough Riders and 1,259 horses and mules set out by train for Tampa, Florida, where they would soon board the steamship Yucatan for the short ride to Cuba. Due to intense political pressures from Washington to speed up the engagement, only eight of the 12 companies made the trip leaving most of their horses and mules behind. They arrived in Cuba virtually horseless, forcing cavalrymen to march long distance through hot, humid, and dense jungle conditions. By the time the expedition was over, however, nearly a fourth of the Rough Riders would be lost to malaria and yellow fever, creating a double vacuum of lost fighting strength and deteriorating morale. Of the three major engagements fought by the Rough Riders, the Battle of San Juan Hill was the crowning achievement of the war. Before the charge, Roosevelt taunted some reluctant non-Rough Rider soldiers not to leave him alone in a charge up the hill, drawing his sidearm and aiming it at the group, insisting that if they failed to charge with his Rough Riders, he would shoot them dead on the spot. In response, the Rough Riders chanted in jest, Oh, he always does, he always does prompting the hesitant soldiers to fall in line for the assault up the hill. Astride his favorite horse named Texas, Roosevelt then led the charge up San Juan Hill, while his regiment of Rough Riders followed up without hesitation. Despite heavy casualties inflicted by high ground Spanish troops, San Juan Heights would be taken within the hour. Two weeks later, the three-month-long Spanish-American War would be over. And there you have it, Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, Ernie Pyle, America's eyewitness to war. Unquestionably the most famous and beloved American war correspondent of World War II, Ernie Pyle's distinctive folksy writing style brought the horrors of war into living rooms throughout the United States. Embedded with frontline troops in the European theater of operations from 1942 to 1944, Pyle wrote about ordinary dog-faced infantry soldiers 
which he called the underdogs of World War II. Through his heroic reporting, Pyle became friends with enlisted men and officers alike, as well as war leaders such as Omar Bradley and Dwight D. Eisenhower. After returning stateside to shake off a severe case of battle fatigue, Pyle returned to the trenches in 1945, this time in the Pacific Theater of Operations. Reinforcing his status as the dog-faced GI's best friend, Pyle wrote a column from Italy in 1944, proposing that soldiers in combat should get fight pay, just as airmen receive flight pay. In May 1944, Congress passed a law that became known as the Ernie Pyle Bill, authorizing 50% extra pay for combat service. Syndicated in over 400 daily and 300 weekly newspapers, his most famous column was the death of Captain Waskow when he was reporting from Anzio during the invasion of Italy. I don't know who that first dead man was, he wrote. You feel small in the presence of dead men and ashamed at being alive and you don't ask silly questions. He further wrote that as dead soldiers were brought down a mountain from the front lines, one of them that was laid out in the dim moonlight was much beloved Captain Henry Waskow of the 36th Infantry Division. Pyle wrote, then a soldier came and stood beside the officer and bent over and he too spoke to the dead captain, not in a whisper but awfully tenderly and he said, I sure am sorry sir. Then the first man squatted down and he reached down and took the dead man's hand and he sat there for a full five minutes holding the dead hand in his own and looking intently into the dead face and he never uttered a sound all the time he sat there. And finally he put the hand down and then he reached up and gently straightened the points of the captain's shirt collar and then he sort of rearranged the tattered edges of the uniform around the wound and then he got up and walked away down the road in the moonlight all alone. When Pyle was killed during the Battle of Okinawa, April 14, 1945, President Harry S. Truman said of the gutsy reporter, no man in this war has so well told the story of the American fighting man as American fighting men wanted it told. He deserves the gratitude of all his countrymen. Pyle's wife, Jerry, would die later that same year from complications of influenza. And there you have it, Ernie Pyle, America's eyewitness to war, today on The Daily Dose. If you like learning something new every day, subscribe to The Daily Dose on YouTube or sign up for emails at dailydosenow.com. Today on The Daily Dose, British airmen crash a Nazi party. On the 10th anniversary of Hitler's ascension to power, the British Royal Air Force sent three twin-engine bombers on the RAF's first-ever daylight bombing raid over Berlin, with the intention of disrupting Luftwaffe commander Hermann Göring's pep talk to a war-weary German public. At 11 in the morning, when Göring was scheduled to address a parade from the Air Ministry building, three de Havilland mosquito bombers, known affectionately by the Brits as the Mossy or the Wooden Wonder, flew a daring low-altitude bombing raid over central Berlin, prompting one eyewitness to later report that Goring was boiling with rage and humiliation, since the successful mission completely discredited Goring's claim to the German people that enemy aircraft would never fly over the Reich. To further the hurt, during the afternoon of the same day, three more Mossies from the 139th Squadron bombed Berlin's largest indoor sports arena where Nazi propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels was scheduled to address the day-long celebration of the Nazis' rise to power. Of the six Mossies flying over Germany that day, 105th Squadron leader D.F. Darling and his navigator William Wright were shot down near Altengrabo, Germany, taking the lives of both brave men. After the humiliating attacks, Goring would say that it makes me furious when I see the mosquito. I turn green and yellow with envy. The British, who can afford aluminum better than we can, knock together a beautiful wooden aircraft that every piano factory over there is building, and they give it a speed which they have now increased yet again. And there you have it. British airmen crash a Nazi party. Today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose. Operation Reunion. 
When the Soviets swept into Romania in late August 1944, the subsequent release of 1,162 captured Allied airmen sent a wave of optimism throughout the 15th Air Force in Italy, as well as a major morale boost for the American public back home. Operation Reunion stands to this day as one of the high-water feel-good moments of World War II. As the highest-ranking prisoner of war in Romania, Lieutenant Colonel James A. Gunn promptly received permission to organize the repatriation of Allied POWs to their British and Italian air bases. Gunn teamed up with Constantine Cantacuzino, a 38-year-old Romanian prince who commanded the 9th Fighter Group for the Romanian Air Force. Bazu, as he was known to his friends, cut a dashing figure with his movie star good looks and vibrant personality. Before the war, Bazu had captained the Romanian hockey team, broken an automobile speed record between Bucharest and Paris, and later won a national aerobatics championship that elevated him to superstar status in Romania. Adored by women, according to one of his friends, Bazu had his pick from countesses to cooks. With gun wedged into the cramped radio compartment of Bazu's German-built Messerschmitt 109, with American flags hastily painted on both sides of the fuselage, Bazu flew the pair into Gunn's home air base at San Giovanni, Italy, delighting an audience of 15th Air Force personnel when the much-loved commanding officer emerged from the tiny single-seat fighter. 56 B-17s were mustered for the airlift of POWs, flying into Romania in three waves of 12 bombers each, timed to arrive in Bucharest at one-hour intervals. A total of 739 POWs were repatriated on August 31st, while the remaining 393 prisoners would fly home on September 1st, including 12 ambulatory patients on stretchers. The final stragglers who had evaded capture in Romania would be flown home on September 3rd, closing out Operation Reunion with a total of 59 fortress sorties, 94 lightning sorties, 281 Mustang sorties and one C-47 sortie, repatriating a total of 1,127 Americans, 31 British airmen, two Dutch naval officers, one French soldier, and a Romanian stowaway with shaky claims to American citizenship. Back at their respective bases, half-starved POWs slowly came back to life. And there you have it, a feel-good moment in World Today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, The Rape of Nanking. During the Second Sino-Japanese War, over 20 million Chinese civilians perished due to attrition or massacres by Japanese forces. The most famous and brutal of these, which still remains an obstacle in Sino-Japanese relations to this day, was the Nanking Massacre of 1937, also known as the Rape of Nanking. After war broke out in July of 1937, by December of that same year, Japanese forces had closed in on Nanking, which at the time was the capital of the Republic of China. Chinese forces were quickly overwhelmed by the Japanese, prompting Chinese leader Chiang Kai-shek to order a full retreat. Many soldiers dressed as civilians to blend in, which prompted Japanese commanding officer Prince Asaka to encourage his men to actively engage in rape, murder, torture, theft, and arson. Beginning on December 17, 1937, and lasting for six blood-soaked weeks, foreign journalists and other observers witnessed the wholesale gang rape and slaughter of Chinese civilians and military personnel alike. For the two decades leading up to the Second Sino-Japanese War, most people in Japan saw the Chinese as an inferior race, which infused a further contributory motive to the genocide at Nanking. After Japan's surrender following the Second World War, historians have been unable to accurately estimate the death toll at Nanking due to the destruction or disappearance of Japanese military records. But in 1946, 
The International Military Tribunal for the Far East estimated 200,000 casualties during the six-week rape of Nanking. While the Chinese Nanking War Crimes Tribunal of 1947 placed the death toll higher at 300,000 lives. The International Military Tribunal for the Far East further estimated that 1,000 women were gang raped each and every day of the occupation as Japanese soldiers went door to door searching for girls. Most were killed immediately after being raped, often including gruesome mutilations of their bodies. The Reverend James M. McCallum wrote in his diary, People are hysterical. Women are being carried off every morning, afternoon, and evening. The whole Japanese army seems to be free to go and come as it pleases, and to do whatever it pleases. After the surrender of Japan in 1945, the principal commanding officers in charge of Japanese troops in Nanking were put on trial. General Matsui was indicted and executed for deliberately and recklessly ignoring his legal duty to prevent breaches of the Hague Convention, while his Sautani was tried and executed by the Nanking War Crimes Tribunal. Other commanders had died during Japan's subsequent involvement in World War II, while Prince Asaka was granted immunity from prosecution due to his status as a member of the imperial family. Isamu Chao, an aide to Asaka, and the person many historians believe issued a kill all captives memo to Japanese troops at Nanking had committed ritual suicide during the Battle of Okinawa. And there you have it, the rape of Nanking, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, the French sink their own navy. Following the Allies' successful invasion of French North Africa, Nazi leaders reneged on their armistice of 1940 with Vichy France, setting in motion operations Anton and Lilla with the intent of capturing French warships and submarines for use against Allied naval assets. Long before the Germans set their sights on the French fleet, British and American leaders feared such a takeover by the Nazis, obliging the British to attack the French Navy at Mer el Kabir on July 3, 1940 followed by the Battle of Dakar on September 23rd of that same year. On November 11th, 1942, German and Italian troops closed in on the French coastal city of Toulon, home to the French fleet, which triggered Vichy Secretary of the Navy Admiral Gabriel Offan to order Admirals Jean de Laborde and André Marquis to oppose the invading armies without bloodshed by means of local negotiation. If that failed, his orders went on, then the admirals were obliged to scuttle their ships in port or at sea. Long before the impending attack by the Germans and the Italians, the French Navy had strengthened Toulon's defenses against an anticipated attack by Allied forces, which included a premeditated game plan for scuttling the fleet if an Allied attack was deemed imminent. On November 27, 1942, Four German combat groups and a motorcycle battalion entered the Greater Toulon area at 4 a.m., catching Vichy officers completely by surprise, but not before one of the officers transmitted the order to Admiral Laborde to scuttle the fleet as quickly as possible. Scuttle, 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 the order went out from Laborde's station on the battleship Strasbourg, prompting scuttling crews to set demolition charges and open sea valves on as many ships as possible. The Germans' main force got lost on the foreign roads surrounding Toulon, giving the French a full hour's head start. And when the Germans finally reached the gates of the naval base, French sentries further delayed their entry with the fabricated need for additional paperwork. In the end, of the 164 vessels in the French fleet, 77 were successfully scuttled, while three destroyers, four submarines, and 39 small ships were captured by the Germans costing the lives of 12 French combatants and wounding 26 others. The Germans, in turn, would suffer only one wounded soldier during the assault on Toulon Harbor. And there you have it. The French sink their own navy, today on The Daily Dose. Today in The Daily Dose, the Battle of the Bulge. Called the greatest American battle of the war by Winston Churchill, the Battle of the Bulge in the Ardennes region of Belgium 
was Hitler's last major offensive in World War II against the Western Front. Lasting six brutal weeks in raw winter conditions, from December 16, 1944 to January 25, 1945, some 30 German divisions attacked battle-weary American troops across 85 miles of densely wooded forest. When the Nazis' unexpected offensive swept into the Ardan, the Allied line buckled and pulled back in the appearance of a large herniated bulge, which gave the battle its everlasting name. The formerly serene region of Ardan was hacked to pieces by brutal fighting against the German advance at St. Vith, Elsenborn Ridge, Helfelais and Bastogne, leading U.S. Army soldier Charlie Sanderson to write of the event. Did you ever see land when a tornado's come through? Did you ever see trees and stuff twisted and broken off? The whole friggin' forest was like that. Belgium townspeople put away their allied flags and brought out their swastikas, not knowing which side would ultimately win the battle. Hitler's mid-December blitzkrieg banked heavily on the strategic nature of bad weather, subjecting American troops to freezing rain, thick fog, deep snowdrift, and record-breaking low temperatures, resulting in more than 15,000 cold injuries, such as trench foot pneumonia and frostbite. I was from Buffalo. I thought I knew cold, reflects Baseball Hall of Famer and World War II veteran Warren Spann. But I didn't really know cold until the Battle of the Bulge. Supreme Allied Commander Dwight D. Eisenhower and George S. Patton Jr. led the American offensive to restore the weakened front, sending in 230,000 soldiers and airborne units into Bastogne, where the Germans had surrounded thousands of Allied troops. When the Germans sent a message demanding the surrender of the 101st Airborne Division on December 22, 1944, they got a one-word answer from its commander, Brigadier General Anthony McAuliffe, and that word was nuts. Three days later, Patton's Third Army finally arrived to push back the German line and rescue the surrounded troops. Germany's failure to divide American forces embedded in the Ardan paved the way to victory for the Allies, but only at an egregiously high price. One million-plus Allied troops fought in the Battle of the Bulge, with approximately 19,000 soldiers killed in action, 47,500 wounded, and 23,000 plus missing and forever unaccounted for. The Germans suffered almost matching losses, making the Battle of the Bulge one of the bloodiest events of the war. Get your nerd on with The Daily Dose and learn something new every day. Subscribe to The Daily Dose on YouTube or sign up for emails at dailydosenow.com. Today on The Daily Dose, the Battle of Guadalcanal. When Japanese troops swept onto Guadalcanal in June of 1942, followed by American Marines two months later, intent on removing the enemy from the island, few people outside of Polynesia had ever heard of this 2,000 square mile speck of jungle in the Solomon Islands. Over the next six months, Guadalcanal and its neighboring islands would prove to be a critical turning point between the Allies and their Japanese adversaries during World War II. Surprised by the Allies' offensive, the Japanese made determined attempts between August and November to retake the airfield they had begun to build on Guadalcanal. The campaign would involve three major land battles fought in dense jungle conditions, seven pivotal naval battles, five nighttime surface actions and two carrier battles, and almost daily aerial dogfights that lasted until early November, when the Japanese made their last ditch attempt to land enough troops on Guadalcanal to retake their geographically strategic yet uncompleted airbase. In December, the Japanese surrendered their efforts to retake the island, evacuating the last of their remaining forces on February 7, 1943. The Battle of Guadalcanal followed the successful Allied defensive actions at the Battle of the Coral Sea and the Battle of Midway in May and June of 1942. Along with the battles of Milne Bay and Bunagona, the Guadalcanal campaign marked the Allies' transition from defensive operations to offensive superiority, effectively seizing the strategic initiative 
in the Pacific theater of operations. While the Japanese were clearly in a defensive rather than an expansionary mode after their losses in Okinawa, the Japanese would finally surrender on September 2, 1945, after the Americans dropped an atomic bomb on Hiroshima on August 6, followed three days later with a second nuclear detonation at Nagasaki. And there you have it, the Battle of Guadalcanal, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, World War I mustard gas joins the fight against cancer. When the Germans introduced the horrors of chemical warfare to the battlefields of the First World War, one of their favorite go-to agents was the devastating sulfur-based cytotoxic chemical known as mustard gas. Although banned by the Geneva Protocol of 1925, the outbreak of World War II caused concerns from the Allied nations that Germany would yet again revert to chemical weapons. The Allies' concerns led to further study, which discovered that mustard gas, or nitrogen mustard, appeared to be an effective treatment against cancer. As a result, two pharmacologists from the Yale School of Medicine were commissioned by the U.S. Department of Defense to investigate potential therapeutic applications of chemical warfare agents. Lewis Goodman and Alfred Gilman observed that mustard gas was too volatile an agent to be suitable for laboratory experiments. But when they exchanged a nitrogen molecule for sulfur, they discovered a more stable compound in nitrogen mustard. A year into the start of their research, a German air attack at the Americans' 15th Air Force supply port of Barrie, Italy, led to the exposure and death of 1,000 port workers. When a secret cargo of mustard gas bombs released their deadly contents when they exploded on the SS John Harvey, Dr. Stuart Francis Alexander, an expert on chemical warfare, was subsequently deployed to investigate the aftermath. And upon autopsy of the victims, he discovered that a profound lymphoid and myeloid suppression had occurred after exposure to mustard gas. After their initial anti-cancer discovery, Goodman and Gilman set up an experimental animal model where they established lymphomas in mice, treating the cancers effectively with mustard agents. Next, in collaboration with thoracic surgeon Gustav Linskog, they injected mustine, the first prototype nitrogen mustard chemotherapy agent, into a patient with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, observing a profound reduction in the patient's tumor masses. After the first clinical trials for the newly discovered chemotherapy agent was reported in 1946, chemotherapy has become one of the primary cancer treatment options throughout the modern world. And there you have it. World War I mustard gas joins the fight against cancer. Today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose. The Japanese holdouts of World War II. Of the more than six million men who fought in the Imperial Japanese Army during World War II, given the remote nature of many South Pacific battlefields, some soldiers failed to get the memo that the war had ended on August 15, 1945. Japanese holdouts either doubted the veracity of the formal surrender of Japan, or simply failed to receive any form of communication that their war against the Allies had been lost. For instance, on January 1, 1946, 20 Japanese soldiers hiding in a tunnel on Corregidor Island surrendered to U.S. servicemen after learning the war had ended from a newspaper they found while collecting fresh water. In late March of 1947, Lieutenant Ai Yamaguchi and his corps of 33 soldiers emerged on Peleliu to attack a U.S. Marine Corps detachment stationed on the island believing the war was still underway. Reinforcements were sent in, along with a Japanese admiral who was able to convince the men that the war was finally over. Notable holdouts continued to surrender into the 1950s and 60s, including Private Bunzo Minagawa, who held out on Guam until May 1960, and Sergeant Masashi Ito, Minagawa's superior, 
who surrendered days later on May 23, 1960, almost 15 years after Japan's formal surrender. Miraculously, some Japanese servicemen continued the fight into the 1970s, including Sergeant Sochi Yoko, who served under Masashi Ito when he was finally captured on Guam. In October of 1972, Private First Class Kenichi Kazuka held out with Lieutenant Onoda for 28 years until he was killed in a shootout with Philippine police. In March of 1974, a full 29 years after the end of the war, Lieutenant Hiro Onoda surrendered on Lubang after holding out on the island since December of 1944, refusing to surrender until he was relieved of duty by his former commanding officer, Major Yoshimi Taniguchi, who had flown to Lubang to formally relieve Onoda. And last but not least, Private Teru Nagamura was discovered by the Indonesian Air Force on Moritai, surrendering to a search party on December 18, 1974, a full 29 years, 3 months, and 16 days after the Japanese instrument of surrender was signed. Now that's a committed patriot. And there you have it, the Japanese holdouts of World War II, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, the Battle of Britain. After the Germans had rapidly overwhelmed France and the low countries of Europe, the Nazis set their sights on the overthrow of Great Britain. Heralded as the first major military campaign fought entirely by air forces, the Battle of Britain ignited on July 10, 1940, before terrorizing the British for the next nearly four months to come. Fought between the German Luftwaffe, the British Royal Air Force, and the British Navy's Fleet Air Army, Hitler's primary objective for the campaign was to compel Britain to agree to a negotiated peace settlement, targeting coastal shipping convoys, ports, and shipping centers such as Portsmouth. On August 1st, the Luftwaffe was directed to achieve air superiority over the RAF with the aim of incapacitating the RAF Fighter Command. Twelve days later, it shifted their attacks to RAF airfields and infrastructure, which included the attempted destruction of British aircraft production facilities. After both German objectives failed, the Nazis shifted their focus to terror bombing raids over British cities hoping that the resultant public outcry and political pressure would force politicians to capitulate. On July 16, 1940, Hitler ordered that preparations be made for Operation Sea Lion, which was the planned amphibious and airborne assault on Great Britain. In September, however, the RAF Bomber Command disrupted the Nazis' invasion plans during a series of punishing night raids on a flotilla of converted barges being outfitted for the coastal invasion of Britain. Combined with the Luftwaffe's failure to gain air superiority over the Brits, Hitler abruptly canceled all plans for Operation Sea Lion. Historian Stephen Bungay cited Germany's failure to destroy Britain's air defenses as the first major German defeat in World War II, while injecting a crucial turning point in the conflict in Europe. The Battle of Britain takes its name from a speech given by Prime Minister Winston Churchill to the House of Commons on June 18, 1940, when he said, When General Vagan called the Battle of France over, I suspect that the Battle of Britain is about to begin. The Battle of Britain would see 1,964 airmen casualties for the British, while the Germans suffered casualties of 4,245. 14,286 British civilians were killed during the four-month running campaign, while an additional 20,325 British civilians were wounded. Despite these egregious losses, the victory in favor of Britain provided an enormous morale boost for the nation, emboldening their confidence that they could and would successfully defend themselves from Nazi aggression. And there you have it, the Battle of Britain. Today in the Daily Dose. Today in the Daily Dose. The Imperial Japanese Navy bombs America. On September 9, 1942, submarine I-25 of the Imperial Japanese Navy 
surfaced 33 miles off the coast of Oregon, directly abeam of the Cape Blanco lighthouse. As his seaplane was being unpacked and assembled from its hold in front of the conning tower, pilot Nobuo Fuchida placed a strand of his hair into a small wooden box. If I were to die and my body could not be recovered, he recalled after the war, these remains would be sent back to my wife. When his plane was assembled and on its catapult, Fujita tucked his 400-year-old family samurai sword against the inner sidewall of his cockpit, a tradition he began in flight school. While Fujita would rather have dropped his ordnance on nearby Fort Stevens, his orders were to drop his incendiary bombs into dense Oregon forest, causing an anticipated runaway fire near the small lumbering town of Brookings. With 520 thermite pellets housed in each of his two bombs, Japanese war planners hoped that the resultant 2700 degree heat from the twin detonations would match the September 1936 fire that destroyed 287,000 acres of Oregon forest while burning the coastal town of Bandon to the ground. The tactic was also intended to scare the Americans, forcing the U.S. Navy to divert war assets away from the Solomon Islands in defense of the western United States. After catapulting from the submarine's midget flight deck and flying a good ways inland near Mount Emily, Fujita ordered his weapons officer, Sochi Okuda, to drop the first bomb followed by a second release a mile or so away. The detonations caused multiple clusters of fires, but thanks to the watchful eye of forest fire spotters and a godsend blanket of rain, the fires were quickly extinguished by the combined hand of man and mother nature. 20 years after the war, a group of JCs from the Junior Chamber of Commerce in Brookings, Oregon, invited Fujita and his wife to visit where Fujita made history as the first and last Japanese fighter to reach American soil. And on May 24, 1962, after Oregon Governor Mark Hatfield and President John F. Kennedy approved the goodwill visit, Fujita and his wife Ayako closed another chapter from one of the bloodiest periods in world history. And there you have it, Nobuo Fujita bombs America, today on The Daily Dose. If you like learning something new every day, subscribe to The Daily Dose on YouTube or sign up for emails at dailydosenow.com. Today on The Daily Dose, the Battle of Midway. Six months after the heavy loss of American servicemen and naval assets inflicted by Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor, Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto became convinced that the Imperial Japanese Navy now enjoyed a numerical advantage over the Americans. Hoping to replicate the success of the Pearl Harbor attacks, Yamamoto sought to annihilate the remaining U.S. Pacific Fleet through means of a surprise attack on American naval assets at Midway Island. After a diversionary attack by a smaller Japanese force on the Aleutian Islands off the coast of Alaska, Yamamoto engaged in a three-pronged attack on Midway. First came air attacks on the island from fighter planes launched by the aircraft carriers Akagi, Kaga, Hiru, and Soru, followed by a naval and infantry invasion of the island. The third phase, after expected reinforcements from Pearl Harbor had been brought in by the Americans, Yamamoto would then lead his own fleet to Midway after waiting patiently 600 miles to the west. Thanks to U.S. Navy codebreakers, Japan's planned attack was known by the Americans several weeks in advance of Japan's offensive. After a failed counterattack by American B-17 bombers on June 3, 1942, the Japanese air attack of June 4 inflicted severe damage to the U.S. base on Midway, which prompted retaliatory airstrikes by U.S. Devastator torpedo bombers against the four Japanese carriers. While Japanese Zero fighters shot down the first wave of American fighters, the second wave hit pay dirt against the Akagi, Kaga, and Soru. After the losses, Japan's surviving carrier Hiru launched two attacks on the USS Yorktown aircraft carrier, which had to be abandoned yet remained afloat. After the loss of the Yorktown, U.S. dive bombers took out the Hiru, 
putting an end to any hopes for a victory in favor of Japan. In the end, the U.S. victory in the Battle of Midway ended Japan's expansionary aspirations in the Pacific, forcing them into a defensive posture until their surrender on September 2nd, 1945. And there you have it, the Battle of Midway, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, the Berlin Airlift. After Berlin fell to the Russians in May of 1945, Germany lay powerless as the victorious Allies carved up the nation into four zones of occupation, including the four control zone sectors in Berlin, which as a whole lay in the Soviet sector. Three years later, another battle would be fought in Berlin, this time a battle of political ideology, as well as the first significant chapter in the 43-year-long Cold War. For the first two months after the surrender of Germany, the Russians were the sole occupiers of Berlin, who made sincere strides to get the bombed out and war-weary citizens of Berlin back on their feet again. On July 1, 1945, American, French, and British garrisons moved into their sectors of the city, and while comradeship between the victors of World War II appeared amicable at first, conflict soon began to erode trust between the Soviets and the Western powers. The Russians proposed that the biggest socialist party of Germany should combine with the Communist Party, but the socialists in the Western sector insisted on putting the issue to a vote, suspecting that unity with the Communist would eventually lead to unity under the Communists. The majority vote turned away from the Soviets, and since the Soviets had suffered egregious losses to German aggression in both world wars, Stalin was determined to turn Eastern Europe into a buffer zone to protect Russia from future Aryan hostilities. After the United States, France, and Britain combined their sectors of Germany to create a separate Western state, the days of participation between the Soviets and Western powers rapidly disintegrated. When the Western powers replaced the grossly inflated German currency with the Deutschmark, a currency that was only valid in West Germany, the first major act of the Cold War was officially on. On June the 24th, 1948, the Russians stopped all rail service into and out of West Berlin, while on August 24th, Autobahn and canal links were also blockaded, with the hope of starving Western powers out of Germany once and for all. In response, American and British air crews, along with five other lesser-involved Allied powers, began airlifting supplies for the two million Germans living in West Berlin, a monumental supply line feat that lasted until the Soviets ended their blockade on September 30th, 1949. While the original plan called for 3,476 tons of supplies delivered daily, by the spring of 1949, that number would peak at 12,941 daily tons of coal and inbound essentials. The U.S. Air Force delivered 1,783,573 tons of supplies, while the RAF delivered 541,937 tons. The Berlin Airlift flew over 92 million miles, while at the height of the operation, one cargo plane landed in West Berlin every 30 seconds. The Berlin blockade served to highlight the competing ideological visions for post-war Europe, while playing a major role in drawing West Germany into NATO's orbit several years later in 1955. And there you have it, the Berlin Airlift, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, the history of Veterans Day. When World War I ended in 1918, at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, Armistice Day, as Veterans Day was originally known, was first celebrated on the first anniversary of the conclusion of the war to end all wars. While Memorial Day celebrates American servicemen who sacrificed everything for their country, Veterans Day, or Remembrance Day, as it is known in many other countries, pays tribute to all veterans, both living and deceased, who served their country honorably during times of war and peace. In America, 
The nation's first unknown soldier was laid to rest at Arlington National Cemetery on Armistice Day, 1921. Since that first memorial, other unknown soldiers from America's wars have been interred in the memorial, and it's become tradition for the president or one of his representatives to lay a wreath on the tomb every November 11th. In 1926, eight years after the end of the First World War, Congress passed a resolution calling for an annual observance of Armistice Day to honor the veterans who fought so hard for the nation's freedom and peace. The idea caught on, and by 1938, the day was marked by so many ceremonies and parades that Congress made Armistice Day a legal holiday. After World War II and the Korean War, Americans wanted to open up the holiday, not just for World War I veterans, but for all veterans who served their country with courage and honor. In 1954, President Dwight D. Eisenhower officially changed the name of the holiday from Armistice Day to Veterans Day, while in 1968, Congress passed the Uniform Holidays Act, which moved the celebration of Veterans Day to the fourth Monday in October. The law went into effect in 1971 until President Gerald Ford returned Veterans Day to November 11th due to the historical significance of the date. As of 2018, the United States was home to 18.2 million living veterans who served during at least one war. During America's involvement in her last four wars, 16 million Americans served during World War II, with just under 500,000 still alive as of 2018. Just under 6 million veterans served during the Korean War, with some 2 million still alive while approximately 2.7 million served during the Vietnam War, with 610,000 still alive as of 2019. Most recently, 3 million veterans have served in support of the war on terrorism, making American veterans an ongoing vital asset to the nation's safety and security, both at home and abroad. Hoorah! Hoo-yah! hoo and there you have it, the history of Veterans Day, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, the Huey's role in the Vietnam Helicopter War. For most American combat personnel who served in Vietnam, the classic image of the helicopter war was the Huey Bell UH-1D. The Huey was ready to back troops up, insert or extract them from hot zones, or rush the wounded to field hospitals. While 11 different types of helicopters were deployed during the Vietnam War, the Huey became an indispensable asset in the jungle war against the Viet Cong, since its vertical takeoff and landing capabilities allowed soldiers to be rushed into dense jungles, valleys, or hilltops. Their ability to swiftly insert or extract troops from jungle battlefields became standard practice for war in Southeast Asia, while the Huey's ability to evacuate the wounded and swiftly convey them to medical facilities proved to be the difference between life and death for tens of thousands of casualties. First introduced in 1959, the Huey was built by Bell Helicopter to meet a 1952 U.S. Army requirement for a medical evacuation and utility helicopter for an increasingly likely conflict in Southeast Asia. The Huey was the first turbine-powered helicopter built for the U.S. military, with more than 16,000 produced since 1960, while over 7,000 were deployed during the Vietnam War. Crewed by one to four servicemen, the Huey has a maximum takeoff weight of 9,500 pounds, with a flight capacity of 14 troops or six occupied stretchers. Packed with a maximum airspeed of 135 miles an hour, the Huey offers a range of 315 miles at a cruising speed of 125 miles an hour, with a service ceiling of 19,390 feet, dependent on factors such as weight and air temperature. The Huey also touts a dizzying rate of climb of 1,755 feet per minute. When communist-manned 
12.7 millimeter ground-based machine guns came on scene, known by American helicopter crews as 51 calibers. Hueys were mounted with a counter arsenal of heavy machine guns until the M60 became the standard helicopter door armament on most Vietnam era slicks, which first employed a swivel mount on top of a fixed pintle mount. As the war progressed, door gunners employed bungee cords to suspend and retain their M60s, which allowed for increased firing angles, as well as easier and faster accessibility. A total of 1,925 Hueys were lost in combat, while an additional 1,380 were lost in operational accidents, making the Bell UH-1D Huey one of the most critical assets over the jungles of Southeast Asia. And there you have it, the Huey's vital role in the Vietnam War, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, Buffalo Soldiers. Originally members of the all-black 10th Cavalry Regiment of the United States Army, the group that would later become known as Buffalo Soldiers, formed on September 21, 1866, at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. The nickname Buffalo Soldiers was given to the Black Cavalry by Native American tribes who fought against them in the Indian Wars, which became synonymous with all the African American regiments formed during and after 1866, including the 9th and 10th Cavalry Regiments and the 24th, 25th, and 2nd, 38th Infantry Regiments. Buffalo Soldiers would see action in the Indian Wars, the Johnson County Land War of 1892, and the Spanish-American War of 1898, including the infamous Battle of San Juan Hill in Cuba. While the 9th and 10th Cavalry Regiments were mostly disbanded by the start of World War II, the 92nd Infantry Division, known as the Buffalo Division, saw combat during the Italian Campaign while the 93rd and 25th Infantry Regiments saw combat in the Pacific Theater of Operations. Separately, independent black artillery tank and tank destroyer battalions, as well as quartermaster and support battalions also served in World War II, each outfit carrying out the traditions of Buffalo soldiers. Despite official resistance and administrative barriers, Black airmen were trained and played a key role in the air war in Europe, gaining a reputation for skill and bravery beyond compare. In early 1945, after heavy losses during the Battle of the Bulge, American forces in Europe experienced a shortage of ready combat troops, which eventually relaxed the embargo on black soldiers in combat. By war's end, a total of 909,000 black Americans would participate in the Second World War. In 1948, President Harry S. Truman signed Executive Order 9981, which desegregated the military and marked the first federal legislation that went against the societal norms implemented through Jim Crow laws. During the Korean War, Black and white troops operated in integrated units for the first time, while the Buffalo Soldiers 24th Infantry Regiment was the last segregated unit to engage in combat until the 24th was deactivated in 1951. On December 12th of that same year, the last Buffalo Soldier units, the 27th and 28th Cavalry, were disbanded, marking the close of the proud legacy of Buffalo Soldiers for a full 85 years of American military history. And there you have it. Buffalo soldiers fight with honor and courage for the American cause. Today on The Daily Dose. If you like learning something new every day, subscribe to The Daily Dose on YouTube or sign up for emails at dailydosenow.com. Today on The Daily Dose, the Hitler Youth of Nazi Germany. In the early 20th century, Germany had for many years a history of youth organizations, some linked to a particular church or political party, while others were staunchly non-sectarian. Most of these groups held a common theme of friendship and healthy social engagement, 
And while many of these organizations united and flourished based on the strength of their leadership, by far the most predominant and lasting of these organizations was the Hitler Youth. The Nazi Party had its roots in the infant German Workers' Party, which Adolf Hitler reluctantly joined in 1919. By 1921, the organization had morphed into the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or NSDAP, with Hitler as its leader. In the summer of 1921, an 18-year-old former National German Youth Leader, Gustav Adolf Link, applied for membership with the NSDAP, but was denied due to his age. Link persisted in his bid to join the organization, and in 1922, the Youth League of the NSDAP had been formed under his leadership. Membership was for Aryan German males only between the ages of 14 and 18 years, while foreigners and Jews were vehemently disallowed. When Link was ousted in 1926 for financial improprieties, the paramilitary group was renamed the Hitler Youth, roughly one year after the foundation of the Nazi Party. Members of the Hitler Youth were seen by most Germans as a way to ensure the future of Nazi ideology, including anti-Semitic racism and the belief in Aryan supremacy among the races of men. Training included hiking and camping, as well as weapons training, assault course circuits, and basic military boot camp preparation. The aim was to instill in German youth the motivation that would enable its members to fight faithfully for the Nazi cause, should Germany ever see the need to go to war. Emphasizing physical fitness and military training over academic pursuit, the principles of self-sacrifice were instilled in each and every member. Emphasizing the Nazi party over secular practices, Hitler youth were used to break up church gatherings and religious youth groups while interfering with church attendance any chance they could get. While the educational and training goals of the Hitler youth attempted to undermine the values of the traditional elitist structures of German society, their training also aimed at obliterating the distinctions between the classes, replacing class stratifications with the political goals of Hitler's totalitarian dictatorship. And there you have it. The Hitler Youth of Nazi Germany. Today in the Daily Dose. Get Today in the Daily Dose. The Yalta Conference and the fate of post-war Europe. Known as the Crimea Conference, or more popularly the Yalta Conference, the big three allied leaders came together at a palace in the Black Sea resort town of Yalta to determine the post-war fate of Europe. Arriving on the 4th of February, 1945, and lasting for the next seven days, U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, and Soviet Premier Joseph Stalin met at Lavadia Palace to shape a post-war peace that represented not just a collective security order, but a plan to give self-determination to the liberated peoples of post-Nazi occupied Europe. Marking the third wartime meeting between the Big Three, by the time of the Yalta Conference, the Allies had liberated all of France and Belgium, with fighting now closing in on the western border of Germany, while in the east, Soviet forces were less than 40 miles from Berlin, having already pushed the Germans out of Poland, Romania, and Bulgaria. During the talks, Stalin agreed to enter the Pacific War against Japan within three months after the fall of Germany, and since the Russians had suffered egregious losses to German aggression in both world wars, the group agreed that Poland, Romania, and Bulgaria, the historical corridors for forces attempting to invade Russia, would remain in the Soviet sphere as a security buffer for a war-weary Soviet nation. The conference further set the boundaries for post-war occupation zones in Germany, including one for each three principal allied nations attending the conference, along with a fourth zone for France, whose leader Charles de Gaulle was snubbed from the meeting, a diplomatic slight that caused a deep and lasting resentment in the French leader. Despite the fact that Berlin resided in the Soviet zone, the city was further divided into four zones of occupation, again by the principal allied nations. A declaration of liberated Europe was also created by the Big Three, which encouraged the people of Europe to create democratic institutions of their own design, 
and to hold free elections for governments responsive to the will of the people. And there you have it, the Yalta Conference and the fate of post-war Europe, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, the Opium Wars. In earlier times, opium was perceived in China as a relatively harmless medicine, but a new practice arose in the 18th century of smoking opium recreationally, which vastly increased demand while leading to the widespread addiction of the Chinese population. In an attempt to curb the growing problem, Chinese Qing Dynasty emperors drafted a succession of laws from 1729 to 1831, which made the drug illegal, yet imports continued to grow as smugglers and corrupt officials gorged on massive profits. Before the First Opium War, China enjoyed a favorable trade balance with Europe selling porcelains, silk, and tea in exchange for silver. In the late 18th century, however, the British East India Company expanded cultivation of opium in its Indian Bengal territory, selling it to private traders who transported it into China and passed it on to Chinese smugglers. By 1787, the company was sending 4,000 chests of the drug annually into China each containing 170 pounds of opium, creating a nation of addicts which the Qing dynasty sought to eradicate. By 1833, opium trafficking into China had soared to 30,000 chests a year. As a result, two wars waged between the Qing dynasty and the Western powers using the Chinese populace as a profit generator. The first Opium War was fought from 1839 to 1842 between the Qing Dynasty and Great Britain, while the second was fought between the Qing Dynasty, Great Britain, France, and Russia from 1856 to 1860. In each war, European soldiers and naval assets employed superior military techniques to defeat Qing belligerents, compelling the Chinese to grant favorable tariffs trade concessions and territory, including the transfer of Hong Kong to Great Britain. The two wars resulted in the Treaty of Tietzin on June 26, 1858, forcing China to pay reparations for the expenses of both wars, while expanding the number of ports open to European commerce. The treaty also legalized the opium trade, granting foreign traders and missionaries full rights to travel freely within China. And there you have it. Greed and substance abuse wins the opium wars. Today on The Daily Dose, get your nerd on. Today on The Daily Dose, America enters World War II. As more than 2,000 American soldiers and sailors lay dead, among the burned ruins of Pearl Harbor's battleships, planes, and airfields, President Franklin D. Roosevelt knew that there could be but one response. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Less than 24 hours after the attack on Pearl Harbor, President Roosevelt addressed a joint session of Congress, delivering an impassioned oratorical display that demanded a declaration of war against Japan. The unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7th, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. Within an hour after his speech, Roosevelt had his declaration of war. Three days later, Germany and Italy declared war on the United States, who in turn declared war on all Axis powers. Across the nation, young men poured into recruiting stations, eager to stick it to the enemy. Hollywood became a contributing propaganda arm, stirring the fires of patriotism with movies promoting the war effort. Don't kid yourself. The doc says I'm in perfect shape. That's the stuff, Harry. Stick around. I'll be right with you. You mean you're joining up? Well, sure. They can't keep me out now. Next! Women joined the workforce, famously led by Rosie the Riveter. 
By early 1942, America implemented a rationing system, everything from rubber to gasoline, butter and bread. Leisure time was slashed dramatically as a nation came together to build the machines necessary for an Allied victory. We are now in this war. We're all in it, all the way. Every single man, woman, and child is a partner in the most tremendous undertaking of our American history. On December 8th, 1941, the United States joined a war that by its very breadth and scope would cost the lives of 60 million people, while ultimately excising a gruesome evil. At war's end, four long years later, life in America and around the world would never be the same. And there you have it. America enters World War II, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, the Battle of the Somme. Considered the most bloody battle of World War I, the Battle of the Somme was fought by the armies of the British Empire and the French Third Republic against the German Empire, lasting from the 1st of July to November 18, 1916. While the French and British had committed themselves to an offensive along the banks of the Somme River in France, the Allies agreed upon a strategy for a combined offensive against the Central Powers in early 1916 by the French, Russian, British, and Italian armies, with the Somme Offensive comprising the Franco-British contribution in the push to crush the Bosch and thereby shorten the war. Prior to the first offensive, the Allies launched a week-long heavy artillery bombardment which saw more than 1.75 million shells hurled at a 15-mile German front north of the Somme River, which aimed to cut the barbed wire guarding German defenses, at the same time destroying the enemy's entrenched positions. When ground fighting began on July the 1st, the German Second Army suffered a crushing defeat against the French and the British, yet the victory came with egregious losses to Allied personnel. The British alone suffered 57,470 casualties, including 19,240 killed in action, making it the single most disastrous day in British military history. The battle was further notable for the importance of air power, as well as the first appearance of the armored tank in 20th century mechanized warfare. The battle would rage on for nearly five long months, yet by October, Bad weather stymied all hopes of an Allied victory, with Allied soldiers struggling to cross muddy terrain under fearsome attacks by German artillery and fighter planes. The Allies made their final advance in mid-November, attacking German positions along the Ancre River Valley, until the arrival of True Winter shut down the Allies' offensive on November 18th, ending a fearsome battle of attrition along the banks of the Somme at least until the following spring. Over the 141-day offensive, the Allies had advanced just seven miles, failing completely in their fight to break the German line. While the battle was intended to hasten victory over German aggression, the stalemate would see more than three million men fight in the Battle of the Somme, with over one million wounded or killed in action, making the Battle of the Somme one of the deadliest conflicts in recorded human history. And there you have it, the Battle of the Somme. Today on The Daily Dose. Get your, get your nerd on with The Daily Dose and learn something new every day. Subscribe to The Daily Dose on YouTube or sign up for emails at dailydosenow.com. Today on The Daily Dose, how Detroit outbuilt her enemies during World War II. When Allied troops landed at Normandy during the D-Day invasions of France, the invasion force included 50,000 vehicles of all types, well over 5,000 ships, and more than twice that number in airplanes. While many factors led up to victory, in both theaters of war, one key element was the ability of American industry to outbuild Germany and Japan in the largest mechanized war the world has ever seen. Detroit automakers played a key role in the Allies' victory 
when they switched from building cars to building the machinery of modern warfare. For example, Ford's enormous Willow Run plant produced a total of 8,685 B-24 heavy bombers, outputting one plane per hour by early 1945. Due to the use of interchangeable parts, Willie's Overland, Ford, and Bantam produced more than 1.3 million Jeeps, or Blitz buggies as they were affectionately known. Just before his death in 1945, famed war correspondent Ernie Pyle wrote of the Jeep, Good Lord, I don't think we could continue the war without the Jeep. It does everything. It goes everywhere. It's as faithful as a dog, as strong as a mule, and as agile as a goat. Detroit also provided the war effort with a steady supply of tanks from Chrysler's enormous Detroit Arsenal tank plant, including 3,352 M3 tanks and 17,947 M4 Sherman series tanks, or approximately 36% of the total 49,234 Sherman tanks built for the war effort. General Motors also joined the fight by constructing 21,000 amphibious landing craft known as duck boats, costing the U.S. government $10,800 for each amphibious vehicle rolling off GM's assembly lines. GM also produced an arsenal of other war material, including nearly 120 million artillery shells, over 39 million cartridge casings, 206,000 aircraft engines, 13,000 Navy fighter planes, 854,000 transport trucks, and nearly 2 million machine guns. With the fate of the free world at stake, Detroit and its surrounding industrial communities played heavily into America's quest to outbuild Hitler and Hirohito, allowing American industrial might to play a starring role in the Allies' eventual victories over Nazi and Japanese aggression. And there you have it. Detroit outbuilds her enemies. Today in the Daily Dose. Get your nerve. Today in the Daily Dose. Woodrow Wilson hallucinates at the Paris Peace Conference. During the Spanish pandemic of 1918, like other presidents before and since his administration, U.S. President Woodrow Wilson attempted to downplay the disease as the deadly pathogen spread to every corner of the globe. Citing key evidence from Wilson's papers, presidential historian Tevi Troy called Wilson the worst U.S. president in terms of handling a disaster. Troy writes in his book entitled, Shall We Wake the President? Two Centuries of Disaster Management from the Oval Office. The federal response to the influenza outbreak in 1918 can best be described as neglectful. Hundreds of thousands of Americans died without President Wilson saying anything or mobilizing non-military components of the U.S. government to help the civilian population. In April of 1919, while sailing to the Big Four peace talks in Paris, Wilson and many of his staff contracted Spanish flu, including Wilson's daughter Margaret, several members of his Secret Service detachment, Wilson's stenographer and his chief usher, while the Big Four were trying to resolve questions concerning German reparations, the creation of the League of Nations, and the threat of Bolshevism, Wilson's hallucinatory response to the flu and its associated high fever severely jeopardized the outcome of the talks. As the president's illness worsened, key aides became alarmed when the normally predictable Wilson began to blurt out unexpected orders. On one occasion, the president created a scene over pieces of furniture that had suddenly disappeared in his suite room, even though nothing about the furnishings had been moved. The president further became convinced that he was surrounded by French spies. We could but surmise that something queer was happening in his mind, Chief Usher Erwin Hoover later recalled. One thing was certain, Hoover goes on, Wilson was never the same after his little spell of sickness. Wilson's shift in mentation would forever impact the outcome of the Paris Peace Conference and ultimately the Treaty of Versailles, for while Wilson's initial stance was that the winners of World War I should go easy on Germany to facilitate a lasting peace, after coming down with influenza, 
Wilson conceded to the other world leaders' demands, setting the stage for a settlement so harsh and onerous to Germans that it became the leading rallying call for a revitalized German nationalism, the rise of Adolf Hitler, and the advent of World War II. And there you have it. Spanish flu destroys a sitting president's mind. Today on The Daily Dose, get your nerve. Today on The Daily Dose, the Bataan Death March of World War II. In early 1942, the Japanese bombed Manila after it had been declared an open city, forcing a humiliated Douglas MacArthur to escape the Philippines before his 80,000 American and Filipino troops surrendered at Bataan. While the Japanese were woefully unprepared for such a massive surrender, some 50,000 wounded, disease-ridden, and starving Allied prisoners began a disorganized, ill-supplied march through blazing heat to inadequate prison camps 100 miles to the north, kicking off the Bataan Death March, which would last for several brutal days to come. To the Japanese, the ancient samurai code of Bushido emphasized death before dishonor, which meant that even before the march began, Japanese soldiers who oversaw the prisoners considered them subhuman and largely worthless. As a result, Japanese soldiers beat Allied prisoners brutally, chopping off fingers to get West Point rings, murdering any man caught with Japanese currency. The men walked in 105 degree heat without water, forcing prisoners to run into carabao wallows, pushing aside the surface scum for a desperate drink of water. The move would prove to be lethal in many ways, since their swallows of tainted water onboarded bacteria such as dysentery and cholera. To fall back or fall out of line was to dive any Japanese bayonets, bullets, or swords. Strength and perseverance was a prisoner's only path to survival, and when the Japanese hit a given prisoner, his only recourse was to immediately retake his feet. Anyone who failed to get up was killed on the spot. Men helped their weakened comrades to keep their feet and stumble onwards toward the camps. The death toll would have been much higher if not for the brave Filipinos along the route, who attempted to give the prisoners water and sugar when the Japanese weren't looking. Those who were caught were instantly executed. The movement of Bataan prisoners to camps in the north began on April 9, 1942 and lasted for several days to come. Exact death toll numbers can only be estimated, with likely figures in a range from 5,650 to 18,000 lives. By the end of the war, being a prisoner in the Imperial Japanese Army would prove to be 17 and a half times more lethal than fighting them. While Allied prisoners held by the Germans saw an approximate 4% death rate during the course of the war, those in Japanese custody saw a pronounced jump in mortality figures to 27%. And there you have it, the Bataan Death March of World War II, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, the Potsdam Declaration, the biggest bluff in World War II history. While the objective of the Potsdam Conference of 1945 offered the chance for the big three Allied leaders to discuss the fate of post-war Europe, the Potsdam Declaration of July 26, 1945 was an intentionally ambiguous demand for Japan's immediate and unconditional surrender. Until newly minted U.S. President Harry S. Truman made his late appearance to the conference, at the insistence of the new British Prime Minister Clement Attlee and Soviet leader Joseph Stalin, a ground invasion plan of Japan, known as Operation Downfall, had been widely discussed by Allied leaders, even though General Douglas MacArthur's own staff had resigned itself to an estimated 31,000 Allied casualties in the first month of combat alone. The Joint Chiefs were even more pessimistic speculating that any successful invasion of Japan would come with an Allied death toll upwards of a half a million lives. Ominously, 
the U.S. War Department had already ordered half a million Purple Heart medals in advance of the anticipated invasion. Instead, arriving to the meeting with news of a successful nuclear detonation at Alamogordo Bombing and Gunnery Range in New Mexico, Truman confided to the other leaders that the U.S. had two ready nuclear bombs for deployment. After absorbing the news, the leaders landed on a strategy which rested on four sequential elements, the issuance of an ultimatum of surrender to Japan, which if unheeded, would prompt the Americans to drop one of their nuclear bombs on a major Japanese city. Next would come the public declaration of war upon Japan by the USSR, followed by more nuclear strikes on Japan until the empire finally capitulated. The strategy was a bold-faced bluff, since the U.S. had only two working nuclear bombs at the time, with a substantial lag time before any additional bombs could be made ready. On August 6, 1945, a Boeing B-29 superfortress named Enola Gay lifted off from Tinian Island with a bomb nicknamed Little Boy in its Bombay hold. Hiroshima was the primary target, with Kokura and Nagasaki as backup alternatives. The nuclear weapon was armed shortly before arriving over the target, which was then dropped and detonated at an altitude of 1,750 feet, instantly destroying a 4.7 square mile area while killing an estimated 80,000 people. When Japan failed to capitulate, on August 9th, America's second nuclear bomb, nicknamed Fat Man, was dropped on Nagasaki. While a third bomb was expected by August 19th, four days before delivery, Japanese Emperor Hirohito formally announced the surrender of Japan. And there you have it, the big bluff that ended World War II, today in the Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, the Mexican-American War. In the 1840s, America was still a fairly young country, and its people and politicians were hungry for westward expansion. President James K. Polk was especially eager to acquire more territory. His belief in manifest destiny, the idea that the United States had an inherent obligation to expand westward across the North American continent, further incentivized American pioneers to migrate west. Pioneer motivations were many, including spreading religious dogma to striking it rich in business or simply setting out for a fresh start. The rush for westward expansion didn't sit well with Mexico, who was already bitter about losing Texas to the U.S. after Texas won its independence from Mexico in 1836. President Polk wanted California and New Mexico as well, and after he offered $30 million to Mexico for a possible land transfer, Mexico refused to sell. In light of his belief in manifest destiny, Polk refused to take no for an answer, sending in troops to occupy a disputed area of the Texas-Mexico border. When American and Mexican troops clashed over the issue, Polk seized the moment to declare war on Mexico on May 13, 1846. While the two-year conflict would see 21 major battles, Kit Carson participated in the conquest of California from Mexico, rising yet again to national acclaim when he walked 15 miles barefoot to fetch reinforcements from San Diego after the disastrous Battle of San Pascual. Ultimately, Mexico proved ill-prepared for war due to messy internal politics and a woefully undertrained army. After two years of fighting, Mexico was defeated and in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, Mexico ceded a third of her territory to the U.S. Ceded lands included modern-day Utah, California, Nevada, Arizona, and Texas, making the land transfer the largest single territorial expansion in the history of the United States. The war further helped to solidify the reputations of many U.S. generals, including future President Zachary Taylor, as well as Civil War titans Robert E. Lee and Ulysses S. Grant. And there you have it, the Mexican-American War, today on The Daily Dose. If you like learning something new every day, 
subscribe to The Daily Dose on YouTube, or sign up for emails at dailydosenow.com. Today in The Daily Dose, The Manhattan Project. Cloaked in deep secrecy during World War II, The Manhattan Project was a joint research and development project between the United States, Canada, and Great Britain with the goal of developing the world's first nuclear bomb. Led by Major General Leslie Groves of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and nuclear physicist Robert Oppenheimer, the director of the Los Alamos Laboratory in New Mexico, the project began modestly in 1939 but quickly grew to employ more than 130,000 people at its peak operation. 90% of the project's cost, nearly $24 billion in today's currency, was spent on building factories for the production of fissile material, while less than 10% went to the actual development and production of nuclear bombs. Research took place at more than 30 sites across the U.S., England, and Canada, yet despite its massive scope and reach, The Manhattan Project remained top secret throughout its seven-year lifespan. Two types of atomic bombs were developed concurrently, including the relatively simple gun-type fission bomb and the more complex implosion-type bomb. The first gun-type bomb, known as Thin Man, proved impractical for use with plutonium, so the project moved on to a second gun-type bomb known as Little Boy despite the complexities of enriching its uranium-235 isotope. Nearly all of the program's uranium enrichment occurred at the Clinton Engineering Works at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, which included electromagnetic, gaseous, and thermal enrichment techniques. A concurrent plutonium enrichment process was carried out at the Metallurgical Laboratory at the University of Chicago which designed the X-10 graphic reactor at Oak Ridge with additional reactors at the Hanford Enrichment Site in Washington State. These efforts would result in the first plutonium implosion-type bomb codenamed Fat Man, which was further refined and developed at Los Alamos. The first nuclear device ever detonated was an implosion-type bomb codenamed Trinity, which was detonated on July 16, 1945, at New Mexico's Alamogordo Bombing and Gunnery Range. A month later, Little Boy and Fat Man bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki respectively, which would ultimately result in Japan's unconditional surrender on August 15, 1945, just four days before a third nuclear bomb was scheduled for detonation over a third major Japanese city. The Manhattan Project would formally end in 1946 after its final nuclear detonation test at Bikini Atoll, known as Operation Crossroads. In January 1947, the Manhattan Project would be replaced by the creation of the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission. And there you have it, the Manhattan Project, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, the Cobra's role in the Vietnam War. Early experience in Vietnam persuaded the U.S. Army that the Bell UH-1 transport Huey needed an air escort, prompting Bell Helicopter to step in with the company-funded Model 209 gunship development of the Huey. The new helicopter retained the dynamic systems of the UH-1 Huey models, but married these to an exceptionally slim fuselage that seated just two crew members in tandem with the weapon officer below and forward of the pilot for the best possible field of vision. The Huey Cobra, or Snake, as the Bell AH-1 became known, was rushed into production and service, and the helicopters were delivered into Southeast Asia on small transports for local assembly and rapid deployment to units stationed in South Vietnam. The Cobra also pioneered a new concept of armament, with a gun turret under the chin controlled by the weapon officer and four hard points under the stubbed wings for gun pods and rocket launchers controlled by either crew member. Both the weapon officer and the pilot possess control capabilities of the aircraft should one or the other become wounded during combat. The Cobra was designed to escort troop-carrying UH-1 Hueys while using its superior airspeed 
to soften up landing zones prior to troop insertions, the Cobra was also instrumental in supplying close ground support to pin down American GIs in hot zones, where their lethal firepower could be called in by ground force commanders, delivering quick and highly accurate cover fire and enemy eradication. By using the established technology of the day, the Cobra was a simply maintained attack helicopter augmented by an easy access engine hold, which allowed for routine maintenance procedures in the field. The Cobra's increased airspeed, maneuverability, and rate of climb, combined with a greatly reduced aerodynamic drag associated with its larger Huey cousin, permitting Cobra pilots to arrive over targets in advance of larger slicks, while engaging the enemy for longer periods of time and with larger loads of ordnance. After catastrophic anti-aircraft losses to American helicopters during the 1971 Lam Son Offensive in Laos, Cobra pilots pivoted tactics to what became known as Map of the Earth Low Altitude Terrain Following, which significantly reduced their exposure to inbound enemy fire. Combined with the Cobra's high airspeed and flight performance characteristics, Cobra pilots further developed a return to target maneuver which became the helicopter's equivalent to fixed-wing acrobatics, making the Huey Cobra one of the greatest air assets ever deployed during the Vietnam War. And there you have it. The Huey Cobra snakes its way into aviation history, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, Mosby's Rangers. Initially, John Singleton Mosby was opposed to the South's succession from the United States, but a sense of Southern homeland persuaded him to enlist in the Confederate Army as a private serving under William Grumble Jones. After serving with the Washington Mounted Rifles and later the Virginia Volunteers, General Jeb Stewart took notice of Mosby's aptitude for intelligence gathering. He promoted Mosby to first lieutenant and assigned him to the General's Cavalry Scouts, and in June of 1863, under the authority of General Robert E. Lee and the Partisan Ranger Act as enacted by the Confederate Congress, John Mosby formed and took command of the 43rd Battalion. Mosby's sole tactic involved executing small raiding parties of up to 150 men behind Union lines relying heavily on stealth to enter target areas undetected, executing attacks on Union positions before scattering into the surrounding woods and dispersing the troops among local Southern sympathizers, literally and figuratively melting into the countryside. Mosby's attack and hide strategy operated mainly within the distance a horse could travel in a day's hard ride, which generally amounted to raids within a 25-mile radius of Middleburg, Virginia, although some raids went into Maryland after the battalion expanded to six cavalry companies and one artillery company by the summer of 1864. Mosby believed and repeatedly proved that, in his own words, a small force moving with celerity and threatening many points on a line can neutralize a hundred times its own number. The Rangers' fast attack hit-and-run tactics were largely carried out with two pistols for each raider, since carbines proved to be unsuited for fighting on horseback. Speed, surprise, and shock represented the true secret weapon of Mosby's command, allowing a small, intrepid force to charge much larger lines of Union soldiers, representing one of the first unified displays of guerrilla warfare tactics in American military history. During the battalion's existence, Mosby's Rangers conducted a total of 33 major offensives, making the 43rd Battalion one of the most storied units in Civil War history. And there you have it, Mosby's Rangers, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, a tragic winter at Valley Forge. After the inconclusive Battle of White March, between the Redcoats and the Continental Army, 
American politicians and military leaders began to appreciate the need to defend the greater Philadelphia area from further British incursions. Having already lost control of Philadelphia to superior British forces, General George Washington conducted his 12,000-man army to Valley Forge for their winter quarters. The location made perfect sense, providing Continental soldiers with ready defensive access to the countryside surrounding the city, while its proximity to the Schuylkill River made for an easy resupply route for food, ammunition, clothing, and medical supplies. While additional troops were quartered at seven other locations, including Wilmington, Delaware, Trenton, New Jersey, and Radnor, Pennsylvania, Valley Forge would quarter the largest body of the Continental Army, as well as the place where winter misery and troop fatalities would reach their highest numbers. The march to Valley Forge alone was an agonizing experience for the Patriots, prompting Washington to write, to see men without clothes to cover their nakedness, without blankets to lay on, without shoes by which their marches might be traced by the blood from their feet, and almost as often without provisions as with, marching through frost and snow and at Christmas taking up their winter quarters within a day's march of the enemy, without a house or hut to cover them, and submitting to this without a murmur is a mark of patience and obedience, which in my opinion can scarce be paralleled. While no adequate account exists for the number of log huts built at Valley Forge, most experts estimate a range between 1,300 to 1,600 structures. Yet housing alone failed to eradicate the communal misery faced at Valley Forge. Throughout the winter, Patriot commanders faced enormous supply line challenges at Valley Forge, which was in truth the size of an average colonial city, minus the necessary infrastructures. In large part, supplies dried up due to neglect by Congress, leaving Washington little resource to feed or to adequately close his soldiers. Soldiers and officers alike were put on half rations, while inbound perishable foods frequently rotted before reaching the troops due to poor storage, transportation snafus, and rampant logistical mismanagement. As a result, starvation and filth disease pandemics took the lives of more than 1,700 to 2,000 men, and perhaps as many as 1,500 horses. Years later, the Marquis de Lafayette recalled that the unfortunate soldiers were in want of everything. They had neither coats, hats, shirts, nor shoes. Their feet and legs froze till they became almost black, and it was often necessary to amputate them. By the spring of 1778, Valley Forge bore the dubious distinction of tallying up the highest mortality rate of all the Continental Army's winter encampments, including a higher death toll than nearly every military engagement fought during the Revolutionary War. And there you have it, a bad winter at Valley Forge, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, the Tet Offensive of 1968. During the Tet Lunar New Year celebration, in the late night hours of January 30th, 1968, the Viet Cong invaded every major city in South Vietnam. Planned over the previous six months, Viet Cong commandos dressed as peasants, using civilian transportation to insert themselves into safe houses set up in each major city, while tons of military supplies were stockpiled at secret locations in and around each selected city. When the attacks began, the Viet Cong's Tet Offensive took American war leaders and soldiers alike completely by surprise. How would you assess the enemy's uh, purposes yesterday and today? Uh, the, the enemy very deceitfully has taken advantage of the Tet Truce in order to uh, create max, maximum consternation. In Saigon, the VC targeted key installations, such as the South Vietnamese radio station and the American embassy, where the VC blasted a hole through the compound wall and took control of parts of the embassy. Five hours after the VC entered the compound, almost all of them were dead. Each commando dressed in civilian clothes. They had been armed with American M16 rifles and rocket launchers. 
A villa on the embassy grounds was home to mission coordinator George Jacobson, who became trapped on the second floor when a VC commando entered his home. What could you see from your window? Were the, were the VC in the buildings? No, I did not see any VC in the building, except that I knew that there was at least one VC in my house. Uh, I knew that he was um, on the bottom floor of my house. You had uh, quite a, an escape at the very end. How did that happen? Well, they put riot gas into the bottom floors of my house, which, of course, would drive whoever was down uh, below up top where I was. Uh, they had thrown me a pistol uh, about 10 minutes before this occurred. And uh, uh, with all the luck that I've had uh, all of my life, uh, I got him before he got me. Some of the worst fighting took place in the city of Hue, the ancient imperial capital of Vietnam, where the Viet Cong held out for more than three weeks of bitter fighting. At Khe San in the northwest, American Marines were pinned down and under siege, dependent upon airstrikes to hold off recurrent enemy attacks. More than 80,000 Viet Cong soldiers infiltrated more than 100 towns and cities of South Vietnam, which made the Tet Offensive the largest military operation conducted by either side during the war. Hanoi had launched the offensive in the belief that it would trigger a popular uprising leading to the collapse of the South Vietnamese government, but when the fighting was finally over, the North's Tet Offensive campaign would see 33,249 Viet Cong soldiers killed in action. And there you have it, the Tet Offensive of 1968. Today on The Daily Dose, get your nerd on with The Daily Dose and learn something new every day. Subscribe to The Daily Dose on YouTube or sign up for emails at dailydosenow.com. Today in The Daily Dose, the shot heard around the world. Lifted from the opening stanza of Ralph Waldo Emerson's 1837 poem entitled Conquered Him, the shot heard round the world is a phrase that refers to the opening exchanges during the battles of Lexington and Concord on April 19, 1775, which set off the American Revolution and ultimately led to the creation of the United States of America. Emerson's phrase set off years of open debate between the Massachusetts towns where the battles unfolded, both towns maintaining that the first shot of the Revolutionary War happened directly in their backyard. While the first shots were fired early on April 19th at the Battle of Lexington, taking the lives of eight patriots and wounding one British soldier, the events at Lexington remain confused and contradictory at best. The Northbridge skirmish at Concord, however, saw the first shots fired by Americans acting under orders, resulting in the first British fatalities and the first British retreat. When the Marquis de Lafayette visited the two towns in 1824, Lexington's civic leaders welcomed him to the birthplace of American liberty, while leaders in Concord called their town the place of first forcible resistance to British overrule. President Ulysses S. Grant considered avoiding the 1875 centennial celebrations in the area to evade the issue, and while he ultimately attended, the debate simmers on in the region even to this day. The phrase shot heard round the world has also attached itself to the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo on June 28, 1914, which has long been considered the most immediate ignition point responsible for World War I. Inspired by a Serbian military conspiracy, Serbian Gavrilo Princip was one of six assassins gunning for Ferdinand that day, firing two shots into the limousine carrying the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne. Both the Archduke and his wife Sophie were murdered, triggering an avalanche of military alliances between countries that quickly escalated into the war to end all wars. And there you have it, the shot heard round the world, today in the Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, The War of 1812. At the outset of the 19th century, Great Britain was locked in a long and bitter conflict with Napoleon Bonaparte's France. 
In an attempt to cut off supplies from reaching the enemy, both sides attempted to block the United States from trading with the other. The Royal Navy also outraged Americans by its practice of impressment or removing seamen from U.S. merchant ships and forcing them to serve on behalf of the British. After Napoleon hinted to the Americans that he would stop restrictions, President James Madison blocked all trade with Britain that November. Meanwhile, new members of Congress elected that year, led by Henry Clay and John C. Calhoun, had begun to agitate for war, based on their indignation over British violations of maritime rights, as well as Britain's encouragement of Native American hostility against westward American expansion. By late 1811, the so-called war hawks in Congress kept the pressure on President Madison, who on June 18, 1812, signed a declaration of war against Britain. In order to strike at Great Britain, American forces attacked Canada, which was then a British colony. Battle outcomes remained mixed for both the Americans and the British until Napoleon's defeat in April of 1814 allowed the British to focus their full military attention on the U.S. As large numbers of troops arrived into North America, British forces raided the Chesapeake Bay, capturing Washington, D.C. on August 24, 1814, before burning down government buildings, including the Capitol and the White House. On September 11, 1814, at the Battle of Plattsburgh on Lake Champlain in New York, the American Navy soundly defeated the British fleet. And on September 13, 1814, Baltimore's Fort McHenry withstood 24 hours of bombardment by the British Navy. The following morning, the fort's soldiers hoisted an enormous American flag, a sight that inspired Francis Scott Key to write a poem that would later be set to music and become known as the Star-Spangled Banner. Set to the tune of an old English drinking song, it would later be adopted as the U.S. National Anthem. British forces subsequently left the Chesapeake Bay and began gathering their efforts for a campaign against New Orleans. After Britain's failure to take Baltimore, war ended with the signing of the Treaty of Ghent on December 24, 1814. However, on January 8, 1815, unaware that peace had been concluded, British forces mounted a major attack in the Battle of New Orleans, only to meet with defeat at the hands of future U.S. President Andrew Jackson's army. While the ratification of the Treaty of Ghent formally ended the war on February 17, 1815, many in the United States celebrated the War of 1812 as a second war of independence, beginning an era of partisan agreement and national pride. And there you have it, the War of 1812, today on The Daily Dose. Today on The Daily Dose, the Hundred Years' War. The root causes of the Middle Ages' longest-running war can be traced to the crises of 14th century Europe, which was a period of rising tension between the kings of France and England, involving territorial disputes in Gascony, Flanders and Scotland. As a result of these simmering disagreements, the Hundred Years' War was a series of conflicts fought in Western Europe from 1337 to 1453, waged between the House of Plantagenut and the House of Lancaster, which comprised the dual rulers of the Kingdom of England on the one side, and the House of Valois over the right to rule the Kingdom of France. The war was fought over five generations of kings from two rival dynasties, marking both the height of aristocratic chivalry during the Middle Ages, as well as its subsequent downfall. Two factors lay at the origin of the conflict. First was the status of the Duchy of Guillaume, or Aquitaine, and while the territory belonged to the kings of England, it remained inside the geographic boundaries of the French crown. As for the second trigger point, 
After the last direct Capetian French king had died in 1328, King Charles IV, beginning in 1337, the kings of England lay claims to the crown of France. As the battles ensued, while the French kings possessed the financial and military resources of the most populous and powerful state in Western Europe, the more sparsely populated English kingdoms possessed superior expeditionary armies, as well as disciplined longbow defensemen to stop cavalry charges, which led to repeated victories over the French. England's most predominant early victories occurred during a naval battle at Sluis in 1340, a land battle at Crissy in 1346, and Poitiers in 1356. After the Treaty of Calais brought about a temporary peace, which granted complete independence to the Duchy of Guienne, French King Charles V successfully reconquered the area in a series of sieges. Henry V of England renewed the war in 1415, conquering Agincourt and later Normandy. In 1429, courtesy of Joan of Arc, the siege of Orléans was lifted, followed by the liberation of Paris and Ile-de-France from 1436 to 1441. In 1450, King Charles VII would recapture the Duchy of Normandy at the Battle of Formigny, then took Guion during the 1453 Battle of Castillon. The end of the more than 116-year war was never marked by a formal peace treaty, but died out after the English acknowledged that the French army had grown too dominant to be directly confronted. And there you have it, the Hundred Years' War, today on The Daily Dose. If you like learning something new every day, subscribe to The Daily Dose on YouTube or sign up for emails at dailydosenow.com.